Hi everyone! Welcome to Water Bear Reads, where I discuss illustrated classics and modern classics. My name is Heather. I'm so glad you stopped by. Today I wanted to share another one of my son and my read a book by the decade list and make this one summer themed. If you're new to this channel, my son and I put together lists um, where we read one book from each decade and we also include a book from before the 1900s, so the 1800s or, before, or earlier. We have a lot of fun doing this and this is one of my favorite videos to make. It's actually the type of video that I began this channel with in mind, wanting to share this with everyone. Also, thank you to everyone who entered my giveaway. That was really fun. I wanted to see how it works if I included YouTube. I've always done giveaways via Instagram and Facebook, and this was my first time including YouTube, and I think it went quite well. I should have another um, giveaway coming soon, so thank you so much. Make yourself cozy. Grab yourself a cup of whatever you're enjoying. I'm having a coffee in my husband's number one dad mug because it is June, the month of Father's Day. So I thought I would use this. I got this for him a couple of years ago now, illustrated by Quinton Blake. I'll take a sip and we'll get started. The first book I have for you from the 1800s, published in 1864 by Scottish author George MacDonald, is The Light Princess. A little girl is born to a king and queen who have had a hard time having a child. And um, of course, there's an aunt who was left out of the christening invitation, and this aunt happens to be a witch. And she's so upset about having been left out of this inv invite that she curses the child where she will have no gravity. And eventually they discover that if she's in water, then her gravity comes back. The curse is lifted while she's in water. And there's a lake right outside her castle and so she ends up swimming a lot and staying in the water a lot. And that's one of the reasons why it made me think of Summer, is that she's constantly in the lake. The aunt, who is a witch, discovers how much she likes the water, and she also discovers that her curse does not work in the water, so she makes a plan to drain the lake. My son loved the concept of not having gravity, and there's also a really awesome snake that plays a pivotal role in the story that he just really loved. I love the illustrations in this book. I spoke to you guys about William Penet Dubois before when I was doing my read a book by the decade autumn list. He wrote 21 Balloons, which I recommended then. This is um, at the bottom of the lake, underneath the, all the water. I thought that was pretty cool. There's this beautiful rainbow that comes that comes over the kingdom. I took the cover off because it was it was quite noisy. And yeah, it's just such a wonderful book. It's about stepping outside of yourself to care about someone, to help someone else. And it has great lessons on commitment and follow through. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm really looking forward to reading more of George MacDonald's works. The next category is 1900 to 1910 and written in 1902 by Rudyard Kipling is Just So Stories. These stories can be read um, a little at a time, a story here, a story there, or, or just returning to your favorites, which is where my son and I are at the moment. We tend to return to our favorite stories. These are fantastic stories, um, stories about how certain things that are came to be. When we were reading them the first time, we started making up our own stories in the same vein. My son would make up stories about how, you know, the caterpillar got his furriness or how the zebra got its stripes. You know, we kind of just went with it. Most of the tales are set in Australia, Africa, India. They're all sort of southern hemisphere hot places. My son's favorite, The Beginning of the Armadillos, is actually set in South America. My favorites are Old Man Kangaroo and The Elephant's Child, of course. If your kid is beginning to learn to read, there's a couple of stories in here that highlight why it's important to be able to communicate via writing and reading. I found that very valuable. This version is illustrated by Robert Ingpen, who is one of my favorite illustrators. He's an Australian illustrator. He has quite a few classic versions out that I just really love. Last summer I did a video where I visited the home of Rudyard Kipling in Vermont and showed you all the illustrated versions I had of the Jungle Book and some of my Just So stories as well. And I really love this one. You can actually stay in Rudyard Kipling's house if you want to. I'll put the, a link to the website below. Another reason why this is such a great book for summer 
is because June, of course, is Father's Day month, and this whole book began as stories that Rudyard Kipling told to his daughter Josephine. Let me show you some of the illustrations. Here is from The Elephant's Child. Another reason why I love Robert Ingpen is because he references Rudyard Kipling's original artwork. So, for example, you have here this parade of animals and then the ark. And then you see here the same thing happening in Rudyard Kipling's original illustrations. I just love that Robert Ingpen did that. I have found another version that does it, um, Isabel Brent. And she's an illustrator as well that did Just So Stories. Her version is beautiful. I'll link it below. The next category is from 1910 to 1920. And this book that I'm going to show you, I did chat about it in my very first Read a Book by the Decade video. Um, but I loved it so much. And I can't help but recommend it for summer as well because it fits so well. And that is The Adventures of Maya the Bee. And like I said in my other video, I it's very, it's quite difficult to find any modern illustrated versions in English. There are some in German and Spanish and they're beautiful, but there, there seems to be only vintage books that's in English, unless I'm just missing something and I haven't seen it. Maya leaves the hive and she takes off and she just wants to see the world and she doesn't want to be confined to the hive. She wants to get out there and see everything. She sees this beautiful red dot in the distance and she's got to find out what this dot is, what this red thing is. And she flies off and the closer and closer she comes, we, she sees it's a red rose. Living inside this red rose is a rose beetle and it, he has a really cute little home set up inside this, this rose, which is just really, really neat to read about. What's really fun is that in almost every single chapter, Maya meets a new insect, a dung beetle that pretends that it's a rose beetle because he's too embarrassed to say that he's a dung beetle, a grasshopper, a ladybug. There is one chapter where there's a bit of death in it, but it wasn't death that really upset my son when I read it to him. And he was quite young when I read it to him because it was a character that we didn't really get to know very well. However, it was still a bit shocking and unexpected when it happened. <laughs> there is one part where they go to battle with the hornets. I think it's either the hornets or wasps. I get them mixed up. Let me just show you this version illustrated by Vera Brock. And it's really pretty. I bought it secondhand a few years ago already now. But there's like all these wonderful spreads and I really love her style. Just adore their artwork. One of the characters that Maya meets, the grasshopper. And there's also these really pretty chapter heading illustrations as well as chapter ending illustrations in black and white. It's a really, really pretty version, but I have to be very careful with it because it's old. The spine here is coming off a bit. The Adventures of Maya the Bee, authored by Valdemar Bonzels in 1912. A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh, published in 1926 and illustrated by Ernest Shepard. And although Winnie the Pooh is set throughout the seasons, whenever I think of Winnie the Pooh, it invokes feelings of lazy days and nostalgia and honey and bees and butterflies. And Christopher Robin is always in his shorts and his play, his play clothes. And so whenever I think of Winnie the Pooh, I just think of summer. This is a wonderful read aloud. This, the chapters are short. The stories are um, simple but magical. Even if you don't have kids, if you just want to relax, like truly relax, just grab Winnie the Pooh or the house on the Pooh Corner and read some of the stories. It's just such a great way to begin a day. When I was reviewing for this video, because my son and I read this a few years back, I was busy reading it in the morning with my coffee and I kept thinking, wow, I am so relaxed. <laughs> my favorite stories are when Winnie the Pooh gets stuck in Rabbit's Hole and half of his body is outside in the world and Christopher Robin is reading books to him and stories to him while he loses weight. <laughs> so he can unstuck, get unstuck. But what's really funny is Rabbit, who's on the inside, is hanging his washing off, <laughs> off Pooh's backside. So I always thought that was funny. They're just heartwarming stories. And like I said, just everything about them makes me feel summery. I have these cute little books that come in the set and I almost love them more without the uh, dust jacket on. They have these little, I don't know if you can see it, little bees and a cute little spine from my favorite chapter, one of my favorite illustrations. And then also I wanted to show you this one, which I just found in a book box one day with new illustrations in full color by Ernest Shepard. 
it still has that sort of original feeling to it because Ernest Shepard did the coloration. And then there's the original toys, by the way, on the back of this book, which I thought was really cool. From the 1930s is Thimble Summer by Elizabeth Enright, written and illustrated by Elizabeth Enright. It was published in 1938 and it won the Newbery Award in 1939, and it's set in Wisconsin during the Depression era. We follow Garnet, who is the main character, and her best friend Citronella, her brother Jay, and a newcomer, Eric. And we follow their lives over what becomes sort of a magical summer. And the reason it's called Thimble Summer is because early on in the book, she, Garnet finds a thimble, and she likes to imagine that this thimble is magical, and because later on the summer is magical, it becomes Thimble Summer. When my son and I read this, it was perfect timing because we had just come back from Texas. It was actually last summer. And we had come back from Texas, and Texas was going through a, a bad drought last year. They had not had any rain for quite a long time, and it was so dry. On my Instagram account, I pictured old yeller with the grass in the background. It was just all dry grass. We came back here to Maine, and we were reading it. And when we began the first chapter, the first chapter takes you into that feeling of no rain and that economic fear that people are feeling from not having rain, being, not being able to grow crops. And by the end of the first chapter, the rain comes and it's that feeling in the air and the smell that rain invokes and just that whole electric energy in the air when that first rain comes and the happiness and the joy from getting a good soak that the ground needs and that the people needed. This buildup of fear and then the release and it just completely charmed me. It was also timely because I had also that summer done an Illustrator Explorer for the Jungle Book and as I mentioned earlier in this video and in one of the chapters there's reference made to the Jungle Book which I just had to laugh. Garnet talks about it as being one of her favorite stories. So I just was like wow this is the best book ever. <laughs> it's like perfect timing to read. It's, it's a slight book, it's not terribly thick and very charming. Let me show you a couple of illustrations. There's these chapter heading sketches which I love this with the the mailboxes that you so often see, even today, on dusty country roads. There's some full pagers that, and that's Garnet and her friend Citronella. So now we are in the 1940s, and the book I have for you is Pippi Longstocking by Astrid Lindgren, written in 1945. And this version is illustrated by Lauren Child, who, if you've followed this channel, you know I love her illustrations. I also have this by Lois S. Glansman. I actually did an Illustrator Explorer on my website, and so if you're interested in seeing the various illustrated versions of Pippi Longstocking, you can check that out. The reason I think of Pippi Longstocking as a summer read is that she's so cheerful, she's so happy and adventurous, and she comes from a past that includes pirates and sailing the high sea. In the book itself, it begins in sort of mid to late summer when Pippi moves in to Villa Villa Cuna and next door to Anika and Tommy, who are returning from visiting their grandmother. Pippi is this very interesting character. She picks up horses, she walks backwards, she has a monkey named Mr. Nielsen, never a dull moment around her. And it's very interesting because you can see this book, you can read this book as a child and take great pleasure from it. But also when you read it from a, as an adult, you, you do the same, you, you take great pleasure in it, but you also realize that she's actually neglected. And I think it makes a good discussion about how sometimes people can really put on a happy face, even when they're going through a hard time, they put on an act, and you never really know if somebody's going through a hard time or not. I think that's what speaks to me about this story is that underlying message that's happening throughout all these adventures is that Pippi is actually a child who's been neglected. And let me show you these illustrations. Here's some of Lauren Child's illustrations. And I also love this one when she's going to tea and she's all dressed up. It's a darling version. And then this one is actually one of my favorites. It's much simpler, but I just think it is the cutest Pippi. <laughs> and that's this one right here. And like I said, if you want to see more versions, check out my website. I'll leave the link below. Isn't that sweet?
There's another one that is by Minnie Gray that I also like. I actually did have that one, but I sent it to my niece. That's a really nice one as well. The next book is a book that was at my grandparents' house, and I would read it whenever I would visit my grandparents. Published in 1957 is No Children, No Pets. I love this book so much. One of the things that stuck out the most in my mind is this one scene where somebody makes a comment that it's so hot outside that you could fry eggs on the pavement. And then a little bit later, one of the children in the book, um, Betsy, who's only four years old, is found trying to fry eggs on the pavement. And the story also begins on the 3rd of August. We're following a family of four, a mom and three children. Dad has passed away. To make ends meet, mom has gone back to her job at the library. This letter comes, registered airmail, informing them that they have inherited an, an apartment building in Florida. By the way, at the start of the story, we're in Philadelphia. So they all travel down to Florida and they find that the apartment building it, they have inherited is a bit dilapidated and now they are faced with the choice of what are we going to do about this apartment building. Do we sell it? Do we find a way to manage it? Another problem is the caretaker is missing. What I find most charming about it is the relationships that occur between the young children and the elderly characters. In fact, it actually reminds me a little bit of the Vanderbeeker series in that it's all wrapped up in a building and it's about a group of siblings trying to make a difference in their community. Their apartment building is like the brownstone in the Vanderbeekers. It's exciting at times, there's a hurricane and it's also humorous. There's a lot of funny parts in it and it's just really wonderful. I love Marianne Holland. On my Instagram account, I put up a vintage book of the month, a book that I find in my library, book stacks. And the book of May was another book by Marian Holland called Casey Rides Vanity. Sorry, Casey Jones Rides Vanity. But anyway, and it was just another wonderful book. She's a great author that I feel like her books should be republished. But just to show you the author slash illustrator's sense of humor in her writing, you have this first chapter heading. She's got her registered letter and she's stepping over the cat without even really looking at him. Here's another one published in 1961 is James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. This one is illustrated by Quentin Blake, but when we read it, we actually read the one illustrated by Lane Smith. I'm not going to hold this one up because it's so battered and tattered I found it in a book box, but I'll come back to, to it in a minute and show you the illustrations inside, but I'll hold this one up because it's just so pretty. <laughs> the events of this day begin on a very hot day in summer when James, whose parents had been eaten by a hungry rhinoceros, and then he had to go live with some beastly ants who truly are very abusive to him. He's absolutely miserable. He meets a man all clad in green, and this person gives him these sort of magic crystals and James accidentally spills the magic crystals and the next thing you know a peach tree which has never given off any peaches or blossoms before grows this massive peach. Now the ants they don't waste any time they build a fence around it and decide how they're going to make profit and the, after the first day of making profit they're inside counting their money they, they lock James outside and he's hungry and he looks at the peach and he realizes there's a little sort of hole in the peach so he climbs inside and there he meets a bunch of large insects which become his found family. He stays the night there in the peach and the next morning he wakes up to find that the centipede is outside gnawing the stem of the peach. The centipede gnaws the stem loose and they're on their way. It's a fabulous adventure story. There's sharks in it. And if your kid's into skyscrapers like mine, it's a great story to read. I think what I love about this the most, the value in this book for me, is how when you're surrounded by friends who have got your back or are your found family, how they can really just lift you up and give you confidence and help you to overcome fear of things. That's what James experiences when he meets this family of insects. And they don't look great. You know, they're all bugs <laughs> and they're weird and they're all different and they all have their different personalities. But James 
finds his family in them and he just grows in confidence and he learns to not be afraid of things and I just love that about this book and it, and I remember when I read it when I was little loving it so much but also when I read it to my son it was one more chapter please mommy which happens a lot with Roald Dahl books in our family I decided to read some of Roald Dahl's other books to my son when he was younger and save this one for when he was a little older just because I was worried that it might be a little bit scary for him at times. Let me show you one of Roald Dahl's beautiful illustrations. I really like this one because my son is so into skyscrapers. Lane Smith's has just the most wonderful illustrations and he he's from Oklahoma and he studied in California. I don't know if you know the Stinky Cheese Man, which I think won the Caldecott Medal for him. And there's also the true story of the Three Little Pigs. You might know, you might recognize that one. His artwork was also the basis for the James and the Giant Peach film that came out recently. Here's another one, a really cool one of a shark, of the shark that's in the story. So yeah, 1961, James and the Giant Peach, published in 1973, is William Goldman's Princess Bride. And the reason I think of it for summer is because I think of Princess Buttercup, or, or just Buttercup, and I think of pirates, and as I told you before, pirates make me think of, of summer for some reason, the open seas. And, and also, um, I know that in the movie, the grandfather is reading it to his grandson, but actually in the book, it's read from a father to a son. The whole story, in fact, is sort of wrapped up in this relationship between a father and his son. And so I think it makes such a great book to read during the month of June to celebrate fathers and dads. This version is the Folio Society version illustrated by Mark Thomas, and it's really cool. Let me show you an illustration. I, just, I love his style. I think it's perfect for the book. And I did actually speak about this book before. It was on my top 10 books of 2023 list. I just loved it so much. My son loved it. It has everything in it. It has sharks. It has fencing. It has a, this crazy, scary snake scene that has themes of loyalty, I think. Loyalty between friends, lo loyalty to someone you love. A wonderful read. It has references to The Wizard of Oz. One of the things that makes this such a great book is besides learning the backstory of the wonderful characters that we know and love so well from the movie, you also get William Goldman's little uh, ramblings and his asides. You just never know what he's going to talk about. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's rather funny to read them. I can't tell you how much I loved it. And my son loved it as well. From the 1970s, The Princess Bride. Now we are in the 1980s. For this category, I decided to choose a book that was first a movie and then became a book. And that book, published in, J in Japan in 1988, is My Neighbor Totoro. Mei and Satsuki and their father and their uncle are traveling and they're headed out to the country to a new house that is closer to where their mother is staying because their mother has tuberculosis and she's in hospital. And the girls get to this house and very quickly on they start to feel like there's ghosts in this house, there's strange things in this house. One day while Satsuki's at school, um, little May, who's be left behind with their dad while he's working, their dad is an archeologist and he works for a university and so he's working and raising these two girls on his own. And uh, little May's running around and she wanders into this grove and she sort of has this somewhat Alice in Wonderland experience where she goes through this hole and falls through a tunnel in a tree and then she lands up in a sort of a lair and she meets Totoro. And then later when Satsuki comes home from school, she looks for May and she finds her sleeping in a grove. Later on, as the story progresses, we meet Totoro again at the bus stop, that famous scene where the girls are standing there and May is on Satsuki's shoulders and there's an umbrella and then May's sleeping. And what I loved about this book is it's just so atmospheric. The descriptions of the countryside, it's rural Japan, 1950s, and the description is just amazing. You really get a feel for being there. Like I'll read this part for you from the book, which talks about that scene that I referenced earlier where Totoro sort of comes up to them when they're under the umbrella. Someone was standing next to her. There was a scent in the air like nothing Satsuki had ever smelt before, like dried grass but sharper and heavier. She smelled straw and mugwort, 
lizard tail and mint, clover and daisies, all mixed up in a mysterious pungent scent that cut through the smells of the rain and the mud and the trees. The stranger just stood there. He didn't make a sound. I just thought it was so cool because when you're watching the movie, you don't know what she's smelling and reading the book kind of gives you that extra layer. It's, it's a beautiful copy and it's hardback, it's small, and it has those little acorns on the back. There's some beautiful letters written between the girls and their mom, and they miss their mom so much. And they're just trying to cope with not having their mom around, and it's heartbreaking and heartwarming at the same time. So now we are in the 1990s, and the book I have for you, written in 1996 by Michael Murpurgo, is The Butterfly Lion. And this is just the most beautiful version, um, illustrated by Christian Birmingham, who I love. And it's the 25th anniversary of the story version. The story begins on a Sunday in June when a boy who has been staying at a boarding school and he's very unhappy at this boarding school. He's being bullied by one of the other kids and he's being sort of shamed by this one teacher because he couldn't spell his words right. Um, he decides he's had enough and he goes and he decides he's going to run away. So he's walking down the road after having run away and a car is coming and he quickly ducks behind some iron gates so that the people in the car won't see him. And he finds himself in this sort of garden and he runs into this old lady walking her dog. And the old lady realizes that he's probably a runaway from the nearby boarding school. And so she invites him in for some tea and scones and a little chat. And the rain clears. Did I mention it was raining? It's raining at this time. But anyway, the rain clears. On the hillside, the boy notices this outline of a white lion, a big white lion, like in the same sort of style that you would see the white horses in the UK. And he questions the lady about it. And so the lady embarks on the tale of about this white lion. The story has many settings. It begins in the UK, and then it takes you to Timbavati, South Africa, and then um, later on France. It also has bits that are set during World War I and the lead up to World War I. And there's a bit of romance in it as well. And it's just such a beautiful story. And in the Michael Mopergo books that I've read thus far, there's always this sort of, almost not a twist at the end, but just a, a kind of a beauty at the end of the book that you don't see, like an unexpected beautiful thing that happens at the end of the book that kind of wraps it all together. And I've noticed that in the Michael Mopergo books that we've read so far, and it's, it's that way in this book as well. It was the first book set during one of the world wars that I had ever read to my son. Let me show you this beautiful version. There's the under the dust jacket, which is so pretty. Beautiful full page spreads. And here's another one of the lion. And there's another one. And then there's also these little black and white decorations throughout the book. It's just such a beautiful book. Really, really gorgeous. If you're going to read this, The Butterfly Lion, I highly recommend reading it with this book because it's just such a wonderful story with beautiful artwork. So now we are in the 2000s and published in 2007 is Anna Hibiscus by Atenuke. And this is probably more of an early reader, but I decided to go ahead and include it because it is absolutely wonderful. It consists of four separate stories and the stories evolve around Anna Hibiscus and her family, her two twin younger brothers, her mother who is from Canada and her father who is um, presumably Nigerian. It doesn't actually say where in Africa it's set, but I assume it's Nigeria because Atinuke is from Nigeria. She's Nigerian born and actually living in Wales now. Other characters in the book are the grandparents and the aunts and uncles and the cousins and they all live inside a gated community of sorts, inside one compound and they all help each other out and they're all there for each other. Every chapter has a different story and each story has its own lesson to be learned and like the first story actually ends up being about how the elderly and grandparents still have their role to play in society. And the second story is about valuing your culture and your tradition. The third story is about being grateful for what you have. And then the final is about taking initiative. If you want something, take initiative and get it. It's an extremely charming book that kind of 
gives you that same feel that Winnie the Pooh gives you. And I know I'm from Africa as well, or I spent some time in Africa anyway, I should say. I'm actually from Texas, but spent a lot of my life in Africa. And so maybe it does have that special something for me, but I just felt like anyone would love this book. Here's some pictures. That's at the beach, and that's her mom with her two baby brothers taking a nap after the family comes to help. <laughs> and then this is when her auntie, Auntie Comfort, comes from America to visit them. And she's, she's got suitcases full of things from America that she's bringing. Now we are in the 2010s and published in 2015 is The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's such an eye-opening experience to read this book. It's set in Malawi and in 2000, 2001, there was a terrible famine. And it takes the reader through the experience of how a famine comes to be, what it's like to be in a famine, but it also has that hopeful side to it and that resourceful side to it where this boy, William Kamkwamba, builds this windmill that generates electricity, which helps because then they can pump water to irrigate crops and therefore creating this machine where families can at least water their own plants so they themselves don't starve. It's recommended for 10 and up and I will say that I think you should really stick with the recommendation. <laughs> I didn't. I read it to my son when he was younger and I had to skip over a lot of things. I mean, it's, it is written for children, but nonetheless, there are still some hard parts to read. It's written by William Kamkwamba and Brian Mueller, and it's illustrated by Anna Hymas, who is an illustrator from the UK. And she does the most wonderful chapter headings. I'll show some to you. And also, I wanted to show you there's pictures of William Kamkwamba and his family. So now we're in the 2020s, and the book I have for you, published in 2022, is the National Park Mystery Series by Aaron Johnson, Mystery in the Rocky Mountains National Park. It's the first of a series of what will be 10 books, but I think there's only like four or five out right now. And we love this. We actually listened to this on audio just now this past weekend. We went down to New Jersey to go to a monster truck show. <laughs> Yes, I go to monster truck shows. My son is crazy about them. But anyway, so we listened to this on the way down and my son was riveted and I was riveted. I loved all the extra information that you get from reading the book, survival skills and information in general about animals and plants. We actually have two storylines going on. One is set in 1880 and we focus on Abe in 1880. And then we have another storyline set in present day, which is Jake. And when you're reading the 1880 parts, you get the feel of being in a Western. We follow Jake who, when you enter the book, has lost his grandfather. His grandfather passed away about six months before around Thanksgiving. And his grandfather has left him a scrapbook. And he even left him clues on how to find the scrapbooks. And then the scrapbook is full of clues that Jake has to go on as he goes with his family around these national parks. And the first stop is Rocky Mountain National Park. They set out in the beginning of summer in June, and even though it's June, some of the snow is still melting in that area. He's joined by his cousins, Wes and Amber. All three kids kind of are having trouble at school in the sense with other friends. They're kind of different from other friends. Jake, at one point, talks about how when he was in school, he had two other friends who, as time went on, they got into gaming, and because he wasn't into gaming, he sort of slowly drifted away from them. And I just love that, because I think it's quite a common thing that happens a lot of the time. I highly recommend it. I'm, uh, my son is very excited to read the others in the series, especially Yosemite, which hasn't been published yet, but I think it's going to be book five, just from looking at a certain map on here. I also love, by the way, that there's if, so many beautiful descriptions of nature in Rocky Mountain National Park. And there's lots of illustrations like this one of Emerald Lake. I've never been to Rocky Mountain National Park, but I have to say, if and when we go, I'm going to use this book as sort of a guidebook. I always like to end these with a graphic novel that we've been enjoying. I really enjoy reading the myths and legends of um, cultures, Egyptian, Greek, Aztec myths and legends. It's, I always feel like I want to read them in the summer because most of them stem from warm places, hot places. And so I wanted to show you this series of graphic novels that we really enjoy. 
and it's these books by Joe Todd Stanton, published by Flying Eye Books. And they're all very recent. We have four of the series, I think there's five. They follow the Brownstone family, and it begins with Arthur, and each one of them has an adventure set with the myths, legends, and folklore of a certain peoples of a certain area of the world. So for example, Arthur in the Golden Rope is set within the Norse tales. I think that's followed by Mary in the Riddle of the Sphinx, which is set in Egypt. Kai and the Monkey King comes next, which is set in the East with the myths and legends of Chinese culture. And then we have Luna and the Treasure of Tlaloc with the Aztecs. And there's another one which I think has to do with Greek um, mythology, if I'm not mistaken. We love these. They're at a very easy price point, and they're so beautiful. They're so beautifully illustrated. Each one has a little beginning that says this book belongs to area, and it will have a map. So here's the Norse world. Arthur in the Golden Rope, for example, we follow Arthur. He's the very first of the line, and he likes to collect things, things that are difficult to find. One day, his village is plagued by Fenrir, who is the wolf like character who is the son of Loki. I think that's him right there. You can kind of see him. Arthur doesn't know what to do, so he goes to Thor and he asks Thor if he can help him. And Thor says, yes, he will help him. And so Arthur joins Thor in conquering this beast. That is it. I hope you've enjoyed these books, this read a book by the decade list, summer version. <laughs> Let me know if you've read any of these books uh, and if you have any other summary titles to suggest, I'd love to hear them. I'll be back soon with another video. So until then, have a lovely June, enjoy the warm weather, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.